Please turn with me to Psalm 43, the 43rd Psalm. This is the second book of the Psalms. Uh, there are five books, and we've been studying those. I want to look at Psalm 43 tonight. Now I'm reading beginning with verse 1. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why hast thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me into a holy hill. And to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God. Unto God my exceeding joy. And upon the harp will I praise thee. O God, my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him who is the help of my countenance and my God. This is another psalm that is a petition and prayer. And I think it's very instructive when you feel like you've been wronged. When you have an enemy that's disquieting your soul. Is that we can go to God and use the strategies that the psalmist uses. I don't know if this is a psalm of David, but it very well could be what he prayed to God. When circumstances were difficult. I would say that this is the prayer when circumstances and life are dividing your heart. You'll see what I mean by a divided heart in just a few moments. But things can do that. Have you ever felt like you're distant from God? I know the world can be like that. I mean, worldly people, they're, they're distant from God. They don't, they don't care. But do godly people, as a godly person, you ever feel distant from God? That when life is difficult, you've been treated unfairly, and yet you're still a believer? Can that person, can the Christian, have a divided heart? Wow, this is not a Christian, a godly person, a Christian can have that. When you feel like God has rejected you, when you feel like there's no God up there pleading your case, things are disquieting in your soul because of the circumstances in life. Let's see if that's not the case. I want to say to you that in these first two verses, we find the divided heart of this psalmist. Notice what he's praying for. I want to be vindicated, God, of my enemies. They're ungodly. They're like an ungodly nation, whether the nation was turning against David, if he's the writer. But that nation was made up, oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. This is an ungodly nation. And he says, judge me. It's not the idea of condemn me, but God, vindicate me. I have done right. I am godly. And here are my enemies that are ungodly. They're deceitful. They're unjust. And I want to be vindicated. That's his prayer. Those are the circumstances that he's living in. And he's doing the right thing. Paul says in Romans 12, 19, we're not to avenge ourselves. But give vengeance, give that place of vengeance to God. It's his to deal with. That God, you will bring vengeance. As Jeremiah said, I'm giving this, I'm, I'm pleading with you, God. Here's my case. Now let me see thy justice. Let me see thy wrath. Let me see thy vindication. Let me see what is your glory. Let me see that takes place because I'm, I, I'm all right with that. 
but I'm being hurt. And I want to see your truth went out. And it's not doing that now. Circumstances in life cause this one to go to his father in prayer. And he's doing the right thing. God, vindicate me. That's what God does. But he's not doing it. That's what it feels like. But this wasn't an ungodly man. This wasn't someone that didn't care about God. He said, you are my strength. In verse 2. And Psalm 1830 says that indeed God is a shield to them that take refuge in him. That's what he's doing. God, you're, you're shield to me. I'm taking refuge in you. I'm saying thou art the God of my strength. And then the very next thing, how come you cast me off? Divided heart. How come I feel cast off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? How come I go to bed crying, I wake up sad? Because the enemy seems to be winning. I'm talking to God, and these are my circumstances. God, you are my shield, but I don't feel it in here. I don't feel it at all. And these are the times when we take what the psalmist is about to do. To take to heart, and he offers two strategies. And we'll look at them. What happens when the circumstances in life cause me to have a divided heart that I feel that God you're not close I don't know if you're even there ungodliness is winning out you're godly I'm godly let's win I'm doing what's right how come I feel the oppression of the enemy they seem to be winning and I feel like God this is the way I feel that I've been cast off by you but at the same time God I know you're my strength. I know you're my refuge. Just divided. Remember the, the man in Mark? I believe, but help me in my unbelief. That's a divided heart. Apostle Paul, to be instructive, speaks about himself as divided. The things that I want to do, I don't do. That's a divided heart. That I know what I need to do and I want to do that, but then I don't do that. He describes himself that way under a system of law where we can never be justified by just law. We needed God's grace. And so these are the real times in life that hit us sometime. And what should we do about it? His heart is divided but it's not to the point that he doubts God. You are my strength. But he's just, I don't feel it. He talks to God about it. He offers a fourfold strategy in this petition. I think it's very instructive. Never again in this psalm do you hear him talking about being vindicated of all the wrong that's happening in his life. He didn't talk about it yet. That's a need that he has. That's a real problem at this moment. But he takes this course on the spiritual course that I think is so instructive that will help you and helps me when I'm thinking about here, I'm treated so unfairly. The world seems to be against me. It's on my shoulders. The enemy is ungodly and they're winning. God, I feel rejected by you, but you are my strength. Listen to what he says now. Number one, stage one. Send me light? No. God, send me thy light. Give me relative truth? No. Give me thy truth. Let them lead me. 
He's a man that recognizes he needs guidance. He needs something to guide him through this dark time because he needs light. It's just interesting that the first thing you would ask for, would you ask for light here in this auditorium right now? Water maybe, but light? But you know what? The lights flickered a while ago. You know the first thing I thought about? I hope I have light up here. It's serious because it's dark. Lord, I can't, I know you're my refuge, you're my shield, but I don't feel it. I'm in the dark. I need some light down here in this tunnel. I need some light down here in this pit. And God, I want your light. Send me thy light. And send me thy truth. Okay, this is what I'll do. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Just get your Bible and you start reading your Bible and that's your light that's from God. And that's true. You want truth? John 17, Jesus says, verse 24, Thy word is truth, O God. Get the word. Start reading the Bible. Let that be your guide. Case closed. Let's get on with life. And that may be a, a good strategy, but sometimes we know the Bible. We know it's the truth. We know it's the light. But circumstances make it real dark around us. Just pal me with some more scripture. What's needed now is some insight. And James speaks about that. That when you don't have the wisdom to see through things because of persecution. He didn't say go read the Bible. Maybe you've got that in your heart, but God, I don't know how it's going to work out. He said pray for wisdom. And God will grant it. He will not upbraid you because you ask for wisdom. And he will give it abundantly. But God, I can't see you. I'm, I'll pray to you. I want your light. I want the wisdom to get me through these difficult times. I'll read my Bible. I'm staying close. That's why I read the shield. That's your, my shield if I take refuge in you. I've, I, I haven't forgotten that, God, but my heart's divided. I know that, but I don't feel that. That's what this psalm's about. And I think every child of God in life will go through something like that. We know what the truth is. We need to feel it. Paul writes to the Ephesians, and they have believed the truth of the gospel. Verse 14, they've been sealed. Verse 13, they've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. They know that indeed what's ahead of them is heaven unto the inheritance and the redemption of God's own possession and the praise of his glory. We know what's ahead of them. They've got to, they, they, they understand that. But then he asks God in prayer, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. He's praying that prayer on their behalf. They're secure in the word, knowing what's ahead, but they need the eyes of their heart. That's a spiritual heart. You've got spiritual eyes for a spiritual heart. They need to be enlightened so you may know that hope. Firmly know it. And you know the glories that are connected with that. He said, I want that to be in your heart. Because you need that. Sometimes we need to see how that word's going to work out in our life. And we need some specific help and wisdom. And so when he felt like he was so distant from God so deep in that dark pit, separated from the light, says, send me thy light. The word truth here in the Hebrew denotes something that is substantial, that it's reality. There are a lot of truths running around, and when you test them out, they're not valid, they're not of substance. All of a sudden, they bust and, 
And you think, well, uh, that, that was the truth. No, it's not. But the truth of God is a rock you can build upon. Send me thy light. Send me thy truth. And when I get that, you know where I'm heading? I'm going to God's tabernacle. And I'm going to get as close as I can to his altar. That's what he says. That's stage two. That's what he wants to get close to God. The tabernacle, God would meet above the mercy seat in the most holy place. That would be God's glorious presence. I want to be where God is because I feel so far away. What's the solution? Where can I get close to it? And it was the tabernacle. Here was the David in the days of the Old Testament law. Let them, let the light, let the substantive truth, let them bring me into thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go to the altar of God. He wanted to be cleansed. Because what happened at the altar was the shedding of blood for the sacrifices of sin. He wanted to be clean. Let that truth guide me, and I want to get where your glory is, and I want to get where your cleansing takes place. Tabernacle and the altar. I'm speaking New Testament times now. I'm speaking with Christians. You know we have an altar? Hebrews, the 13th chapter, we have an altar, the Hebrew writer says. In fact, it was an altar in the context that we can partake of that the priest of the Old Testament could not partake of it. When they offered a sacrifice and that blood went into the holy, of holy places, they had to take that body and take it outside of the tabernacle, outside the city. Otherwise, priests could partake of that sacrifice, not this one. And that's the context we see this in. We've got an altar they can't partake of. We, New Testament Christians, have an altar they couldn't partake of. Because Jesus' body shed his, his, his shed his blood so all things could be cleansed. And they took his body and he, he was sacrificed outside of Jerusalem. And in the context, let us go out with him in Jerusalem. Let's face the persecution. What have you? Because we have an altar. We have a sacrifice. And Jesus Christ is our light. Oh, the devil doesn't want you to know that. He's hiding it from him, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. What the devil has done is that here he's hidden from the people the light of this gospel that is of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. He Blinds people so that that glorious gospel of Christ will not dawn upon them. It never wakes them up. It never comes upon their heart. The devil likes it that way. This man isn't devil's camp yet, but he sure is divided. And strategy two is I want to get near God. I want to be cleansed. I want to be where he is, and I want to be his altar. And we can always have the cleansing of our sins at Jesus' altar. We have that as a Christian. And we need to be where his presence is. That'll help us get through these unjust times. Stage three. I'll be able to come to God. And notice what he says. What is God? One of the great passages of the Bible. It says that God is my exceeding joy. Not being vindicated by thee, O oh God. I prayed for that. And there's nothing wrong praying for that. But God, I want 
to feel the joy again. And I want to come near you. I need to be cleansed, I'll be cleansed. But I want you, oh God. Because in my life, you are my exceeding joy. What a statement. What a place to be in your spiritual life. Things are not your joy. Does it mean that we don't enjoy things? Paul writes to Timothy in chapter 6 and talk about rich people. They were to enjoy the things that God has given them. He's given them all things to enjoy. But when you enjoy them apart from God, that bubble will burst one day. When your joy is separated from God, somewhere down the line, because it goes away contrary to God, it will burst. We've got to be so in tune with God and His presence, and that comes from God's Word, that we realize you are my joy. And when you make God your joy, you'll have a joy that nobody can ever take away from you. Oh yes, Psalmist says in Psalm 35 and verse 9, that God is my joy, the joy of salvation. Yes, that's a wonderful thing, that, that I rejoice in being saved. But when your joy is in God, in Hebrews 10, 34, it's just a remarkable statement by the Christians at that time. The Hebrew writer says that when they take away your possessions, and that was happening to Christians, they're being persecuted and they take away their possessions. The Bible says they rejoice. Why? Because they have a better and a more abiding treasure ahead of them they're anchored in God and they have something in heaven that nobody can ever take from you you can deal with life when you've got your priorities set and nobody's going to touch that one nobody because that is my joy God is my joy and when you get to that stage You may never be vindicated by God as far as your enemies. They may win. They may drive a sword down your, into your heart. You may die, but he didn't take away my joy. They didn't take away my abiding treasure. Take away my things. Take away my legacy. Lie and cheat. And, and they say things and just ruin your character in front of people. But you don't ever take my joy. Because God's my joy. That's where we need to be. And you know what? Stage four, he said, when that happens, I will praise God with a harp. I'll praise God with a lyre in the sense of that instrument of music. Of course, in our New Testament worship, we just sing praises. See, so he tells you, you praise God, but he's told you what the instrument is. We know that we, we sing praises unto God. We make melody in our heart to God as New Testament Christians. But that's the way he worshiped. And he said, I'm going to offer praise to God, my God. What's interesting to me is that salvation from sin was not the end of what he's looking forward to. The joy of salvation, that's not the end of my joy. God is my joy. That's the ultimate. And to rejoice and worship because God has become your joy. Not that I've been saved from my sins. Or that maybe I won't be vindicated by him. He said, God, I'm in tune with you. And what impresses me in this four stages, as sometimes people have called it, of this, of this prayer, is that he's not asking for vindication now. He's asking for guidance. And this is the attitude of the spiritual person. It's victorious. When you get this in your mind, and this becomes your spiritual focus, God, I petition you, this is what I want to happen. You wake up in the morning, you'll be different. 
And you can wait on the Lord to take care of his vindicating wrath. And he will. No ungodly, unrighteous, deceitful person is going to win out in the end. And we have to wait on him. Until then, God, unite my heart to fear thy name. Psalm 86, 11. We sometimes have the, I need to unite my heart. And this is how you do it. That God, you're my joy. I want to be in your presence. I want to be clean. I want to have your light. I want to have your truth. That's what's, that's what's of substance. I need guidance. And when I get that, I'm going to praise you. Because God, you're not just God. You're my God. You're my God. The second one, verse 5, learn how to preach to yourself. Talk to yourself. Notice what he does. Why art thou cast down on my soul? Who, who's speaking there? My soul. You're talking to your soul. You're not insane. Nothing wrong with you. This is just the next thing to do. If you ever get this point that you feel like you're so distant from God that he's not listening to your prayers, the enemy is winning, talk to yourself. Why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? I'm upset. I'm uncertain. It doesn't seem to be working out the way I thought. But God, I know you're there. You're my strength. You're my refuge. And I need to talk to myself. You know, when you have anxieties, you got to talk to yourself. When you're having to go under a house in a small, cramped place, you got to talk to yourself. Don't panic. We are sitting in a crowd and, you, and they're closing in on you and we got this claustrophobia. You got to talk to yourself so you can remain calm. We've got to do a lot of talking to ourselves to get through difficulties. And that's what he does here. And so what does he say to himself? Hope thou in God, soul. I shall yet praise him. I know this will work out. He's my joy and his will will work out. I may go through these difficult times. But put your hope in God. Tell yourself that over and over. Hope thou in God. He won't let you down. Because what he is, he's the help of my countenance. I will smile again. I will praise God again. Because he's my God. And I'm going to remain close to him. I can't think of a better passage for Christians, we'll end on this, to use in talking to yourself when times are difficult. In Romans the 8th chapter, we're in a context of persecution where we don't even know what to pray for in this chapter. And we need to have the confidence that God knows your heart and the Holy Spirit makes intercession for you. You have groanings that cannot be uttered. You can't even express this prayer. You may get to that point. And you just express it. God knows. You can't express it. God knows your heart. You don't know what to pray for. Well, Psalmist is telling us what we can do. But maybe I get to that point. The Holy Spirit knows the heart. He will bring that need to you. And it will be taken care of. That's. That's what he's trying to tell the Christian here. And he sums up in verse 28. We know them that love God. All things work together for good. Even what, all things work together for good. Even to them that are called according to his purpose. And he lays out his eternal plan. As if it's already been done. These are past tense. Whom he foreknew, whom he foreknew, he also foreordained. To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the brethren among many brethren. 
be firstborn among many brethren. And when he, whom he foreordained, then he also called. It's a call. He called them. They're called. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. There's the word. That's God's teaching. But I don't feel that. And so what he does from verses 31 following, he gives questions. And I think we can incorporate them. If that's his plan, it's not teaching that you're justified, you're already glorified, and there's no way you can lose that. This is his perspective of what he has planned, and we can be part of that group. But if that's already done, why does he have to have verses 31 following? Listen to it. Because in verse 36, this is how we feel. For thy sake we are killed all the day long. That's what we feel like, God. As Christians, we're going through this sufferance. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Not to be sitting at some man's bosom and be fed from the table. A precious little pet. We're for the slaughter. That's what we feel like. And while that's in the middle... Listen to the question. What then shall we say to these things? Here's God's plan. If God is for us, who's against us? Ungodly people. Unjust people. People who are deceiving the authorities. Deceiving people that have control over my life. I tell you, that's, what, that's what's happening. We've got to talk to ourselves. This is his plan and you're, you got your trust in God. He's your joy. Then you start saying, who is against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall, we, how shall he also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? I'll wait on him. To vindicate me. I'm not going to leave him. It is Christ that died. Yea, he was rather that he was raised from the dead. Who is at the right hand of God. Who maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Ask yourself that. Preach to yourself. Shall tribulation. Anguish. Persecution. Famine. Nakedness. Peril. Sword. Oh, we feel we're slaughtered. But verse 37, Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. I am persuaded. Talk to yourself. I am persuaded that neither life, death or life, angels, principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature, that ungodly, unjust, deceitful person. They can't separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I need to talk to myself of that. Now some say, well, all things work together for good that love the Lord. And so death is going to work together good. You're going to learn some lessons. Losing your job, all that works together for good that you just keep loving the Lord. Broken homes, that just work together for good that love the Lord. Problems at work. Enemies at work, enemies in the church. Now you just love the Lord and all this will work together for good. No, those are the things that I overcome. That's what you overcome. Death doesn't work any good. It's our enemy. Jesus overcame death. I look at death as an enemy. I look at injustice as wrong. And what we see is that, no, these are the things you're more than conquerors. Life, death, any other person. Why? Because they can't take away the priority that I have that, God, you are my exceeding joy. You're not only going to not take away my treasure, but you're not going to rob me of my joy. You can't touch it. Even though the circumstances in life 
are overwhelming, that they are dividing my soul, they're dividing my heart. What I feel in my soul ought to be tuned to what I know in my head, and it ain't working. And I got two strategies when that happens. That guidance, being cleaned by God, coming into his presence with joy, and praising him in worship. And then when I'm alone, I need to talk to myself. God's for me. Now, who is it against me? Life, death, unjust dealings? You haven't touched me. Because you have not separated me from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus. And no man can do that. No woman can do that. No circumstance in life can do that when we have our minds set on the spiritual focus, and sometimes, plan two, you're gonna to have to talk to yourself. And what Paul is doing, he's asking, re asking these questions for the saint who knows. I know what the goal is, but I don't feel it. I've gotten overwhelmed by the difficulties. You can overcome it by talking to yourself. When circumstances are dividing, your heart focus the prayer on the important things. God. Cleanse from sin. Getting right with God. And when circumstances are dividing your heart, why are you saddled, my soul? Hope in God. And it will get you through the dark times and help you to remain faithful unto God. Lesson is yours this evening. If you're not a Christian, want to encourage you to become one. I mean, this is a life that overcomes everything. This is a life that is always going to base their, your life upon the truth of God, that it is that of substance. It will never be a bubble that busts, because God is faithful, and he cannot lie. And when death, the darkness surrounds you, you pray to God for wisdom. And he's not going to upbraid you. Why are you asking? Don't you know the Bible? Don't you know you're supposed to wait in the Lord? Don't you know Psalm 43? Well, I'm learning it. But God, I need some help. He'll give you wisdom abundantly. He's promised to do and he will not upbraid you for asking. Sometimes, God's people who seek God as their refuge, circumstances in life, whether it's sickness, injustice, what have you, divides them. And when that happens to you, remember Psalm 43. Take on those two strategies. And it'll help you get through the dark times. We're asking you, won't you start a life that you can have that kind of relationship with God and let the faith that you have overcome the world, it will. And you can put your hope in God who cannot lie. We encourage you, become a Christian. Let Jesus cleanse you. Let Jesus become your altar. Let his blood cleanse you from all of your sins. And you can be right with God again. If we can help you, please come as we stand, as we sing.